come back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The RoboBees are coming. We've got that story plus the car world order. But first, I want to tell you it's our seventh anniversary. Our pilot episode took off back on October 11th, 2009. So whether you're first time or you're long time, we are really glad you're here joining us on New World next week. The CIA says it can predict social unrest as early as three to five days out. This article comes via Defense One, who notes last year around this time, the CIA opened its first new office since 1963, and it's called the Directorate for Digital Innovation, a seismic shift for the agency that legitimized the importance of technology, including big data and analytics. According to Deputy Director for Digital Innovation, Andrew Hallman, the man tapped by CIA Director John Brennan to run the digital wing, that digital pivot is paying off. The agency, Hallman said, has significantly improved its anticipatory intelligence, using a mesh of sophisticated algorithms and analytics against complex systems to better predict the flow of everything from illicit cash to extremists around the globe. Deep learning and other forms of machine learning can help analysts understand understand how seemingly disparate data sets might be linked and lend themselves to predicting future events with national security ramifications. The article makes notes where Brennan said just this past summer that these open source data sets are now a, quote, tremendous advantage. Meanwhile, Hallman, speaking at a four-day Fed-stival, said, quote, we have in some instances been able to improve our forecast to the point of being able to anticipate the development of social unrest and societal instability, some I think as near as three to five days out. So the Fedstival looks at what's next in the federal government in technology and management. So James, I spoke about this a little bit on the Morning Monarchy, and what I said there is basically the same thing you'll find in most of the comments or replies to this story, and that, James, is what? When you create the unrest, it's easy to predict. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, and that's a fair point. Um, that That's absolutely something we can say with regards to this. But here's my take on this is we know that everything the intelligence agencies tell us is a lie. Either they, they're bluffing and they don't have this type of technology or... They had this type of technology 50 years ago, and what they have now is so much far, far beyond this that we can hardly imagine it. It can't possibly be the case that the CIA is coming out and saying, hey guys, look at this technology we have. This is its capabilities, and this is what we can do. They wouldn't do that unless there is a purpose for announcing this. So what is the purpose for telling the plebs, we can predict what you're going to do? It's, again, part of the panopticon type of surveillance society. Don't worry, guys, whatever you've got up your sleeve, we already know about it. Don't think about it. Um... So I think that's one one aspect of this. Another, of course, is telegraphing to enemies around the world. You know, we look at our super advanced superpowers. Uh, and I don't know, I, I don't know whether to take this seriously or not. I did do that report a few years ago on the eye opener about the sentient world simulation, where DARPA for at least a decade now has had their uh, computers running in the, the bowels of the Pentagon with literally virtual versions of every person on in America, if not the world, I don't know, running in their little simulation and, you know, what happens if, what happens if Trump gets elected? What happens if Clinton gets elected? What happens if, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they can do their little tests in this. Again, I don't know how seriously to take it. I tend to think that this type of technology is almost always just blowing hot air and they're just trying to make you feel like they can do anything. Uh, I don't really think they can see the future. Um, and even if it were true, all this means is that, uh, so what about whatever? Take any situation, Benghazi or whatever. Why didn't you see that one coming, guys, huh? Uh, all, uh, if we take them seriously at this, it means that they are either completely and utterly inept and incompetent because they can't or won't predict basic things like that, or they're lying. They're lying about not being able to see it. They're they're lying. In, they saw it, but they didn't want to tell anyone. So I, whatever way you read this, I mean, I just don't take any pronouncement from the CIA at face value, and nor should we. Um, this is this is again like we've talked about in the last couple of episodes. This is advertising for something to someone. The only question is who is the intended audience. I imagine on on some levels the intended audience is whoever it sort of works on. I guess. And you're noting Benghazi or what about Ferguson? 
for that matter. It's sort of they can look at it and they can use their crystal ball, but yeah, even if they could predict it, obviously sort of not doing anything about it, I suppose. This is something that Jaron Lanier said is coming from the CIA's so-called siren servers. And we'll include links to that story, just like we include links to everything that we mention on these shows down in the show notes, so you can continue to do more research for yourself. And it has also been about a year ago since we talked about, and it broke, the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Now we see Germany votes for EU ban on the sale of internal combustion vehicles by what year? Oh, of course, 2030. This comes via a website, of course, I don't typically take news from, Car and Driver. Members of the German government have just passed a resolution to ban the sale of internal combustion engines in the European Union by 2030. Only zero emissions vehicles would be allowed on the market after that time, according to the resolution. German news magazine Der Spiegel broke the news last Saturday. You can get an English language report on the resolution at Forbes. The resolution was passed in Germany's Bundesrat, the nation's legislative body representing the 16 German states with across-the-aisle support. The resolution implores, and I believe that's really the word used, they implore the EU Commission to ban the sale of new vehicles powered by gasoline or diesel internal combustion engines starting in 2030. Vehicles sold before the ban would still be allowed, but after 2030, automakers would be banned from selling new fossil fuel-powered vehicles in the EU. The Bundesrat has no direct authority over and cannot demand changes to the EU's transportation regulations. But with the largest population and the most powerful economy in the EU, the German government decisions exert huge influence. So, again, we note it was just a year ago, and we covered that back on New World Next Week. Volkswagen CEO resigns as company crashes into carbon emissions fraud. James, we see it everywhere. Why the huge push now for the new car order? Well, this is part of the push, which I think you're going to talk about uh, for the the driverless car order. And I think that this is just a preparatory step. And it's it's almost a psychological operation. Um, Let me take this in a different direction than most people might, because the underlying assumption here is that governments do have the power to tell manufacturers what you can or cannot make. You cannot make that type, or well, you can make it, but you can't sell that type of car. You can't sell that type of car. You can't, you can't do this with your factories, which is a bizarre thing that people have just completely internalized. Oh, yeah. I mean, if the EU says you can no longer produce car- carbon emission- emitting cars, then you can't do it. Um, and that, that paradigm only works in the era of centralized manufacturing in big factories that Obviously, you and I can't own a big car factory. It's only a specialized few. And so, of course, the government can come in and regulate at that choke point. But what if we decentralize the manufacturing of things like cars? Oh, wait, that's already happened. You can download a car. Let me stress this again for people who might not have might not have seen it the first few times I've mentioned it. OS Vehicle is just one example of this. You can literally go and download the blueprints for a car, and if you don't have the materials, you can actually order it from them. You can literally put it together in 45 minutes, a roadworthy vehicle in 45 minutes, if you know what you're doing anyway. Um, that's, that's incredible, and that is the revolution of the future. And I see this type of thing as trying to cut that off at, before we even get there. Because... We are exiting the land of centralized manufacturing. We are entering a time when you literally will be able to create most of these types of things that were just unthinkable. You could never create them yourself. We're entering the time when that will be possible. And that changes everything. They have to have their regulations in place beforehand, so you can't even think about uh, creating your own car or whatever. It's all going to be regulated. It's all going to come from the big manufacturers. The regulations make it so that you can't be a, you know, your own self-sufficient mom and pop operation. It makes it so it's so cumbersome. It's so difficult. You have to produce these driverless electric cars or whatever that only specialized manufacturing can do it. And it'll remain in the same hands of the same few companies. The problem is the genie's getting out of the bottle with 3D manufacturing and 3D printing and all of this. So how do we, how do we put that how do we put the cork back on before the genie gets out well let's smother everything in regulations so this is part of that and the ultimate end goal of this is not just electric vehicles to save the planet it is going to be the driverless 
car order where you don't you don't decide where you're going you know it's all going to be automated don't worry it'll work 99.99999 percent of the time and the intelligence agencies might you know fiddle here and there 0.000001 percent of the time when there's a michael hastings or someone they want to get rid of it'll all work well for everyone right <laughs> you just even conjured up the image i i know when i was a little kid we used to go to amusement parks a lot and at amusement parks you'll find these sort of old tiny cars that are on this track. And I remember as a little kid being able to drive the car because it was on a track. And even though I had the wheel, it didn't matter what I did. It was going to send me around the track and, Oh, look at me, I'm driving. And that's again, a lot of what it seems like we're looking at. We're being turned into an amusement park and it's for a bunch of children who will still go, Oh, golly gee. Uh, and I also was just thinking again, as you're speaking about the, the 3D printing. It's now, in a way, kind of like the Gutenberg printing press. It exists, the technology is there, and the powers that shouldn't be are deathly afraid of it because it's going to give all the underlings the chance to become sort of godlike, essentially. So I do have a couple of related stories, James, that are just from these past couple days. Self-driving cars gain a powerful ally, and that is the government, as the man commonly referred to as President Obama comes out with huge, excited, hypey push for driverless cars in America. Again, that's sort of a toothless thing that we implore that this starts to happen. The other one that came out the past couple of days, Google enlisted Obama officials to lobby states on driverless cars because we have seen the revolving door between the state and the alphabet type of corporations. So on that also aforementioned Morning Monarchy episode, even talked about self-driving cars and what they call the death algorithm. Yes, that is a thing as well. So we're always trying to look at what's coming up and our final story on this seventh anniversary episode number 287 of The New World Next Week does just that and you could file it under Fight the Future. Robotic bees being built to pollinate crops instead of real bees. We get this story via Collective Evolution and our friends at Blacklisted News. Honeybees are, if you haven't heard, dying at alarming rates due to threats like habitat loss and disease, as well as colony collapse disorder, and of course, pesticides, insecticides, and all the other bare Monsanto monstrosities. Last week, even, federal authorities placed seven yellow-faced bee species native to Hawaii on the endangered species list. And while honeybees have been dying off in many countries over the last decade, scientists have taken different avenues for dealing with the crisis using modern technology to replace living bees with robotic ones. Researchers at Harvard University first introduced the robo-bees, as they are referred to, back in 2013. Led by engineer Professor Robert Wood, the team created bee-sized robots that can lift off the ground and hover midair when connected to a power supply. Those details were reported in the journal Science. Harvard graduate student and mechanical engineer Kevin Ma, who co-authored that report, noted now that the team is on the eve of the next big development and that the robot can now carry more weight. So I've got a story going back to 2013 on Media Monarchy when the robo-bees were first announced. And the natural question, again, if you sort of look at some of the comments and replies, the natural question people ask is, oh, so instead of stopping spraying a bunch of poison, which would be the simplest thing to stop doing, we're going to create this whole technological overlay to deal with the problems that have now, that have now come. That's exactly right. That's the point, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's a very, very simple solution to this, which is stop using the insecticides that are killing the bees. But no, I mean, don't do that. No, let's let's engineer robotic bees. What could go right, as you often say on Morning Monarchy? It is, I mean, this is insanity. And everyone, I guarantee everyone in the audience clicks on this with a little bit of dread in their heart thinking about what on earth that are they doing now robotic bees this is insanity it's insanity and the only people who are excited about this i mean are the people who are directly profiting from it i'm sure um no i don't want to live in a world with robotic bees and i mean what are the implications of that where do you stop because you know ultimately if there's a problem with species x why don't we just replace it with robotic species x it'll be great and eventually you know these humans aren't working out so well you know they're they're not taken to the gmos very well hey i got an idea let's replace them with the robotic humans i mean that's uh, that's the point and this is just horrific this is terrible 
the only, again, the only real solution to this, the long term, is not to make get government to regulate the robotic bee industry or, you know, whatever. No, the point is that we have to turn away from this with everything that we have and everything we do. Our money, take it away from these corporations. Everything that we can do to get back to our own things um, in our own communities, doing, growing our own food and living in our own lives. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And I hope we continue to concentrate on that rather than on giving money to the industrial agricultural food system that is more and more being co-opted by literal insane psychopaths who are trying to replace natural species with robotic versions because, hey, it's more efficient. I was actually happy to see just the other day, uh, Reverend Billy, if you're familiar with him, kind of does street theater protest. He was hitting up Bayer and basically saying, it was like, you guys won't address the fact that you created the gas for the chambers and now you want to run our food supply. These are the same people. And they, I was glad to see that they were getting kind of that hardcore into it because that is the reality. These are the people and the connections between the Zuckerbergs and the Gates to the robo bees and the CIA and all of it are all pretty, pretty cozy cronies and start to pull the thread and you'll, you'll see where they all are. So James, I think you're kind of hinting at what, what the positive things are, the good news, if you will. So cops wearing cameras catch a case of what they call contagious accountability. More towns are telling their cops to stop busting pot and the people pushed back at least successfully for a little while against the feds, on the Kratom ban. Those are the three stories I look at on the latest episode of Good News Next Week, the spinoff from this series that tries to look at some of the solutions-oriented stories. You can share open source news using the Good News Next Week and New World Next Week hashtags. And if you value our work, we hope you'll go to mediamonarchy.com slash support and corporatereport.com slash support and help keep real independent media growing. James? I cannot believe we've been doing this for seven years now. <laughs> this series is seven years old now. That's that's incredible. And, uh, well, I'm very happy that we're doing it. Thank you again for bringing these stories. I'm looking forward to doing it for another seven years, at least. Absolutely. Take care.